Welcome to Ever Wondered. In this episode, we're looking at the fascinating world of the honeybee and the complex relationship that we have with these little insects. There are many species of bee, but the one we are referring to is Apis mellifera, also known as the European, Western or common honeybee. Today, about 70% of the world's food crops benefit from being pollinated by bees and one out of every three mouthfuls of food eaten by humans is dependent on bees. While the bee is important, it's also in trouble. Bee populations have been declining worldwide for years and the reasons for that are complex. We'll find out a bit more about that later, but first I'm curious to know more about the bee itself and how it lives. So I've come to meet Associate Professor Peter Dearden from the Department of Biochemistry at the University of Otago. He's been studying bees for most of his life. Bees are incredible organisms. There's, there's nothing really quite like them. They have this amazing social structure that you don't see in many other insects. They have a queen, they have a hive full of workers, and they cooperate as a kind of super organism. Forager bees will go out and find a flower and go back to the hive and communicate that information to their nest mates. And that's the only um, symbolic language that we know about outside apes. Worker bees go through a series of phases in their life cycle. Their first task is to nurse newly hatched bees. Then they move to other tasks, such as cleaning the hive, guarding it, or foraging for food. The workers usually live for three to four months, whereas a queen bee can live for up to five years. The difference between workers and queen bees is quite incredible. And you think that that might be because the worker bees are doing all the work. And they're worker bees, obviously, and the queen's just sitting around being fed. But in fact, the queens can be laying a thousand eggs a night, which is an enormous amount of work. And so it's not that they're working hard, it's that there's something in queen bees that allows them to live longer than the worker bees. Mankind has learnt to harness this structure and now we rely on the honeybee in many ways. Without them pollinating many of our food crops, we couldn't produce the huge amounts of food we currently do. People have predicted that without bees the human race wouldn't last very long. Not sure that that's necessarily true, but they are a really, really important part of the ecosystem and our agricultural systems. Without them I think we'd be having some problems. Peter's also doing research with bees and we'll explore that later. But first, bees are in trouble and they need our help to survive. All around the world, honeybee populations are in decline. This is causing serious worry among scientists and farmers. There are a number of reasons, but one of the contributing factors is the Varroa mite, a parasite that has spread to almost every country in the world, including New Zealand. I've come to Hamilton to talk with Dr. Mark Goodwin from Plant and Food Research. He and his team are trying to find ways of overcoming this pernicious pest. Varroa is a mite that evolved on a different species of honeybees, an Asian species, and jumped species onto the species that we have in New Zealand, which is the same one that's managed completely around the world and does most of the honey production and most of the um, pollination anywhere. Varroa and its original host species coexisted, but Apis mellifera had no natural defence or immunity to it. Varroa spread when bees from neighbouring hives raided colonies that had died out. The raiders carried the mite back to their own hives, and once there, Varroa began breeding. When it wants to reproduce, it jumps off the bee and goes into a cell with the honeybee larvae in it. Just before it's kept over, it rushes down, hides in the brood food, so the other bees don't know it's there. When the cell's kept over, it comes out, starts feeding on the pupae and starts reproducing. The first egg's always a male, the rest are females. They mate in the cell, cell opens, and the new varroa come out to infect new bees. In order to see the problem for myself, Mark took me to view some of his own hives. Looking pretty good today. And here's a frame. This here's all kept brood. So that's, um, pupae that are under the cells ready to merge, and these white cells here are larvae. Does this hive have the varroa mite and how can you tell? It does. Normally it's really hard to see, but you can see bees that's got deformed wings. The deformity is caused by a virus, which is spread by the varroa mite. It is the process of passing on viral infections that overcomes the colony, not the infestation of mites alone. 
There's a whole lot of other viruses that really don't have any symptoms. The only symptoms you find is one minute all these bees are here, the next minute the colony's dead. It's gone. Or, or they're just a queen and a few bees. And that's what makes it hard for beekeepers. Um, the colony just gets weaker and sicker and sicker and they can detect, detect it easily. Hmm. But Varroa catches people by surprise. The only current treatment is to dose infected hives with chemicals twice a year to kill off the mite. But these chemicals are expensive and Varroa is developing resistance to most of these treatments. One promising approach to tackle Varroa seems to be in exploiting one of the honeybee's own survival mechanisms. The bees can recognise a cell that's got a Varroa in, they can open the cell, they can take the pupae and they can kill the Varroa or they can groom each other and take the varroa off and chew them up. But that behaviour is just not frequent enough to be able to put it in control. To harness this behaviour and defeat varroa, Mark has used a selective breeding program using artificial insemination to produce bees more resistant to varroa. On Mercury Island, they have successfully created a colony of bees that is completely resistant to the varroa mite. From this colony, they will try and produce resistant stocks of queen bees, which can then be supplied to the beekeeping industry. To do this though, they would need large numbers of queens each year. Using artificial insemination just wouldn't be feasible for this. So Mark and his team are looking at using DNA technology to identify which genes in the bees creates resistance to varroa. We've got marked bees and we're observing their behaviour to see which ones uncap and which ones we can't. And we can take pieces of their wings now and work out the genetics of the bee from that. And we're then just trying to identify which particular gene it is. And from that we can have a genetic test of the queens to work out which is resistance and not, which will speed that process up hugely. The real challenge for it now is to put in a usable package that the beekeeping industry can use in their beekeeping. As well as finding new ways to help bees, researchers are also using bees to help us, to answer some fundamental questions about development, from conception to birth and beyond. One of those scientists is Peter Dearden, who we met earlier. Peter's research delves into how environmental changes can affect gene expression. In other words, can the environment turn genes on or off? We're trying to understand not only you know, how you make an organism, but how that changes to give you different forms of organism, either within a species with plasticity or across species. Understanding environmental influences on gene expression could lead to better treatments for obesity and diabetes, conditions that are known to be influenced strongly by environmental factors. A key component of Peter's research is tissue plasticity, the ability of organs and other body tissue to change and grow. One of his research projects concerns the development of bee ovaries and explores how royal jelly alters the development of a worker larvae into a queen. So in a normal honeybee hive, there's a queen bee who's the only one with ovaries that lays eggs and all the worker bees have repressed ovaries. And they're repressed by a pheromone that the queen gives off. And if you take the queen away from a hive, under particular conditions, the workers will activate their ovaries and start laying eggs. And that involves an enormous amount of growth and remodeling of the ovary, so there's a huge amount of tissue plasticity producing an, an active ovary. In his laboratory, Peter's team measures gene expression connected with ovary development to determine what genetic differences exist between worker bees and queen bees. The genes are then manipulated to see how that impacts ovary development processes. In some respects, what we've done is we've identified at this point pathways that we think are involved in, in some of these processes. And we can, in some cases, block those pathways or take out particular genes and see changes in, in the way those plastic responses work, which tells us that we've got a gene which really is involved in the process. In continuing with this research, Peter is hoping they can define in a detailed way how organisms and embryos respond to environmental changes. The ultimate goal is that this knowledge will inform future ways of intervening in human diseases. This is a long-term strategy. It's not that in five years' time we're going to be selling you a drug which solves obesity. We can't claim to be doing that at all. But by better understanding this whole plasticity process in a system where the plasticity is huge and 
you know, the genome and the number of genes is quite simple compared to a, to a human, we hope to understand the basic mechanisms. With an understanding of the basic mechanisms, then we have the opportunity to help those guys who work in obesity and diabetes to start thinking about how to intervene. Peter is trying to understand the basic biology of bees. Also at the University of Otago, there's another scientist exploring this fascinating area. Professor Alison Mercer is studying learning and memory mechanisms in animal brains. Understanding those mechanisms may lead to better treatments for some mood disorders and Parkinson's disease. She is using bees in her research because they are extremely good at learning. They remember information and can modify their behaviour based on that information. This is particularly true when they forage. They have to find new sources of food, remember their locations and communicate what they have discovered. So we want to know how is it that the brain of this tiny animal, so it's, its brain is about a cubic millimetre in size, how does that brain actually acquire information and store it? And how does the animal recall that information at a later date? One very sophisticated way bees communicate is by secreting pheromones, chemical compounds that affect their brain and nervous system and modify their behaviour. Some of these pheromones actually affect their ability to learn and remember information. So we're trying to take advantage of that and try and work out what those chemicals are and why it is that they block the animal's ability to learn either uh, about rewards that they have come across or um, punishment, for example. So we're taking advantage of, of uh, the bee's biology to tell us something about how brains work. The queen produces about 50 different chemicals that affect the physiology and the behaviour of all the other bees in the colony. There is currently a theory that one of their pheromones is designed to block any negative association of the attendant bees to the queen so that they will continue to look after her. Alison is studying all of this because while bees seem physiologically remote from humans, there are remarkable similarities between us. All nerve cells in all animals function the same way. And it turns out that the chemicals in the brain of the bee that uh, seem to be playing an important role in learning and memory are exactly the same chemicals that are found in the human brain. We hope that if we can identify the pheromones that are working and affecting learning and memory in, the, in bees, that we'll be able to see whether these same compounds are effective also in the vertebrate brain and maybe uh, possibly for use in, in humans as well. In order to study this, Alison and her team conduct both behavioural and molecular research on bees. To understand associative learning, her team exposes bees to odours. They then reward the bees with sucrose or punish them by giving them a taste they dislike. When rewarded, the bees will put out their tongues. When punished, they will put out their stingers. We can use those simple reflex behaviours to work out what the, whether the bees have learnt or not. So that's what we're doing at the behavioural level and you can find out how long they store the information and under what circumstances they recall that information. And then we take uh, those bees and we look at what's happening in the brain. This work involves recording the activity of cells in the bee brain that are involved in learning and memory and tracing the neurotransmitters involved particularly dopamine. This research has enabled Alison to successfully describe four dopamine receptors in the honeybee brain and that they all function differently. These are traits that are exactly the same in humans. While Alison's work has no direct application in terms of the development of treatments at the moment, it is increasing our knowledge of how brains work and that will have downstream consequences. 
So if we could have a better understanding of how brains function and how this particular compound dopamine is functioning in the brain, then we can look to develop new therapies that will help us treat disorders such as Parkinson's disease and schizophrenia and uh, ADHD. It's important to understand how brains work uh, so that when something goes wrong, you can put it right. We've seen bees prove their worth in many different areas. Now we're going to meet a scientist whose research into bees could help patient recovery after surgery. At the University of Auckland, Dr Guy Warman is studying the effects of sleep disruption in people who have had surgery and how anaesthetics affect a patient's biological clock. One of the things that is well known is that sleep is compromised post-operatively. It appears that when you wake up from an anaesthetic, your biological clock is delayed to a later time zone. And so this research is really all about different mechanisms by which we might be able to address that jet lag, that chemically induced jet lag, and try and improve and speed up people's post-operative recovery. Guy uses bees to study this because they have an innate time sense, what he calls a continuously consulted biological clock. This is driven by a set of clock genes that are very similar to ones in humans. The interesting thing about bees is that they are able to consult that biological clock at any time of the day or night, just like we might a wristwatch. So by looking at their behaviours, you can determine what time of the day they think it is at any time of the day or night. They have two main experiments to study this. One is lab-based and the other in the field. The lab-based experiment involves anaesthetizing an entire hive to see what effect that has on the bees. Many of the bees have small radio chips attached to them, which are scanned as they leave and re-enter the hive. This tells the researchers when the bees are active and when they're asleep. So the height of the bar indicates how many bees are flying out from the hive and uh, when there are large numbers of bees flying, you get a large block of activity. When there's a small um, block of activity, there are very few bees flying out. So that's them sleeping in the middle. Exactly. So they're awake here and they're asleep here. And what happens is we can record this over a number of different days and then give them an anaesthetic, which we've done here in this gap. Right. And you can see that after the six hour anaesthetic that we've given them here, the bees are effectively delayed to a later time zone. Right. There's that shift across. Exactly. And then it takes them a number of days to come back to their normal time zone. This experiment clearly shows that an anaesthetic stops the biological clock until the animal wakes up from the drug. When it does wake, it is biologically unaware that time has passed, even though there may be light cues telling it so. To further test this hypothesis, Guy and his team have devised a field experiment. To get a handle on that, I'm meeting Guy's collaborator, Dr. Craig Miller. So what we did is we trained them to a feeder a certain distance away from the hive and then we translocated them to a new site and saw that they did repeat that behaviour and then at the same time we did, took another group of bees and gave them a six hour anaesthetic and did the same experiment. What we saw is the ones that had had a six hour anaesthesia had actually will change their direction of flight by about 90 degrees. These field experiments used human observers to track the bees' flight paths, but this was not very accurate. To control for human error, they repeated the experiment in Germany using a modified ship's radar. This time, small radar transponders were attached to the bees' backs, enabling the radar to produce a high-resolution image of the bees' flight path. Here we have an example of one of the tracks that we used. Right. Now the control bees travelled in the expected orientation, which is parallel to the feeder in the hive direction, where the bees that have been given a six hour anaesthetic actually flew in a 90 degree angle to the expected. So this is exactly as you expected? This is exactly as we expected. The radar experiment reinforced earlier findings that anaesthetics interrupt the bees' perception of time. Laboratory testing of the bees' genes show that this occurs because the anaesthetic has temporarily stopped the biological clock's gene expression. Because bees have similar biological clocks to humans, Guy has used these findings to create a new form of therapy for patients with this anaesthetic-induced jet lag. 
Research on humans has shown that high intensity light therapy can help reset our biological clock. So the next phase of Guy's research has involved setting up a trial using light therapy on two different sets of patients in hospital. One group receives high intensity light. The other group receives a very dim light which acts like a placebo. We're comparing between whether there's any difference in the sleep quality and sleep timing and in the biological clock time in the patients between those two different groups. While Guy's research has shown that there is a disruption to the biological clock in patients after surgery, it's too early to tell whether the light treatment is going to be effective. He believes, however, that eventually it could be used in conjunction with other treatments such as melatonin, a hormone that is known to also affect the biological clock. By using a combination of melatonin and light therapy, we should be able to address um, any anesthesia-induced jet lag that we see in post-operative patients. Guy Warman and all the scientists we've spoken to could not have started their research projects without the help of Apis mellifera, the common honeybee. We are so dependent on these insects and they continue to provide new ways of looking at our world. Now for the first time in their long history, they are dependent on us. Let's hope we can find a way to continue this remarkable relationship.